We are going to start now with our first presentation by Luik Estevi, who will be talking about uh, Jupiter for scikit learning as a training. Uh, Luik, thank you. All right. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, so I'm Luik Estev, uh, LS Tev on GitHub, or Lustiv, as someone, some people like to call me. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk about how we use the Jupyter ecosystem uh, for the machine learning in Python with scikit-learn MOOC. So first, uh, a few words about me. Uh, so I have a, a particle physics background. Um, uh, the main achievement of my PhD was to measure a cosinus and a sinus uh, with like uh, 0.8 experimental errors, which is uh, which uh, I didn't disrupt particle physics thanks to this because you know you have a strong uh, theoretical guarantees on cosinus and sinus. Uh, but then I went on to work in finance for a bit. I was doing mostly C++, but uh, as much Python as I could. And the last uh, eight uh, years, I've been uh, working as a software developer in Inria and working on uh, open source uh, uh, Python uh, software, among um, which Nylearn, which is on a, a neuro imaging a library based on scikit-learn, joblib, scikit-learn, and uh, Dask, mostly jobsq. And the last two years, I've been involved in this uh, scikit-learn MOOC. Uh, and I've been also uh, using the material for live uh, training, um, uh, something which is called uh, Inria Academy, and those uh, live training for, uh, for companies about scikit-learn mostly. Okay, so that was a few words about me, but this is, a, uh, this is a, a team effort. Basically, it takes a lot of people to do a MOOC. Uh, so you have all the teachers, most of them are uh, like uh, scikit-learn co-contributors or, or, or contributors like Arturo, who is in the room, Olivier, Gail, Guillaume, and, and I, and also Thomas. And uh, that's the teachers, the, the people who created the material, but we also got a lot of help from uh, Inria Learning Lab people, um, all the people you see at the bottom, uh, Aurélie, Laurence, Marie, uh, who actually uh, uh, did the work to put all content inside the, the fun MOOC platform, as we will see, and Benoit, who is an engineer, and. Uh, uh, thanks uh, to, to whom we have a lot of uh, stuff like a forum and uh, Jupyter Hub that we used. And I'm going to go into detail more about that. Okay, so, so the MOOC was a success. I'm going to give you a few numbers uh, to give you some ideas. So we have done like three, uh, three sessions that were like from two to three months long. Uh, since May 2021, there were about like uh, 10,000 uh, uh, participants on average per session. And of course, it's not because you registered that you follow the MOOC. Uh, so basically, roughly 7% of the participants kind of followed it uh, long enough to obtain a certificate, which is uh, about uh, uh, 50 to 60% of the, all the points you can get. Uh, Okay, and, and numbers are good, but also like you have humans behind, and, and I've selected a few feedback that, that are dear to our heart, because basically they are, they are things that we wanted to do when we created this MOOC. So, you know, this one is practice-focused and entertaining at the same time, and it's good for beginners, because it goes from the basics to more advanced levels, so we're super happy about that. Uh, as a trainer, uh, I really appreciate the, the pedagogical approach and the balance between, you know, explanation and practice. That's great. And the last one, which uh, I never know with it, whether it's fully serious or ironic, but basically it's the first time I've been compared to Descartes, which is a, a French philosopher from the Enlightenment period. So, you know, like, we're in the same vein as Descartes. What more could you, could you uh, expect from uh, creating a MOOC? That's one of the best, uh, uh, best compliments you can get. Okay, so the MOOC vision uh, basically is to be accessible with limited requirements, so uh, basic Python knowledge, so you know how to create a function, you know to do a for loop. Um, uh, if you have been uh, using NumPy and Pandas, it will help, but in principle we expl explain a little bit uh, to help you get uh, uh, started. And no machine learning required, so it's really targeting uh, machine people who have never done machine learning. Uh, the goal is to give intuition without going uh, deep into the math, so that you will kind of understand what's happening behind the, uh, uh, for example, decision tree model. But uh, but you don't have to, we don't have to do a lot of math to make you that uh, understand this. Uh, it's a, a common a creative common uh, uh, 
license. So basically, the goal is to make it reusable outside of the MOOC. And the first uh, people that are going to reuse it is us, actually, because we're going to reuse the material in different contexts. So for example, for conference tutorials, uh, for live teaching, like Henry Academy I, I speak, spoke a little bit about that. And also, s some people are using it for university courses. Uh, some of us are reusing it for uh, university courses. OK. So the MOOC content has uh, seven modules. So, you know, like modules are stuff like uh, linear models, decision tree, predictive modeling pipeline. Uh, videos are expensive to produce and, and expensive to update. So we try to uh, do them, uh, not that many of them. Uh, and also on things that don't move, so basically a little code, because like mostly mathematical stuff or intuitions. Uh, uh, so basically, it's mostly a not notebook executed in a Jupyter Arm environment. Uh, we have uh, exercises with solutions so that people can try to exercise and have the solution. It's not evaluated, so it doesn't count for the certificate. But it's also useful outside of the MOOC to give people exercise so that during the sessions they can try exercise and you can have conversation when they have problems or, uh, and you can correct during the live session. Uh, uh, and for the certificate, we have multiple uh, choice quizzes uh, to check basic understanding. And at the end of each module, you have like a, a more complicated quiz where basically to answer a question, you need to write code. So you're, you're faced with a, a notebook with a, a little bit of code to get started. And uh, after that, uh, you're on your own, basically, and you need to, uh, to write code to answer questions. And if uh, you don't manage, we give you some, uh, some hints, or we give you the solution, and then you can go on to the next question. Um, a rough estimation is 35 hours. So it's like a very rough estimation, but it's also what people tell us at the end of the questionnaire when we ask them how much time did you spend on, on different parts. And basically, maybe if I can do that, um, except I don't know where it's going to show up, but basically, um, uh, what? I'm not going to do that then. I'm not going to do that. Maybe at the end, if I have some time to show you. But basically, we have a, a Jupyter book with uh, all this content that is accessible outside the MOOC. OK. So now I'm going to talk about the. Um, about how, how we got set, uh, how we, uh, all the setup for the whole MOOC. So basically, we first have the setup uh, to develop the content. So on this part, we have uh, fully free. We can do whatever we want. And basically, because we uh, used to open source development, we're going to set uh, things up like very uh, similarly to what you, we would do in, uh, for a, a repo like Scikit-Learn. So we use a Jupyter book for the, for the, for the, to, to produce a website. Uh, we use a Visual Studio Code uh, and Jupyter GitHub and uh, CI setup. We're going to talk about that a bit more. Um, so the fun MOOC front is for France Université Numérique. So it's like a, a French uh, endeavor to actually help a university to uh, create MOOC. Um, and uh, it's based on OpenEDX for people that, that know that. And we have a Jupyter Hub for live environment. Uh, it's done by the uh, Benoit from the Enria Academy. Um, and either it's on-premise uh, server or it's uh, uh, through uh, uh, the cloud, uh, OVH, uh, through OVH credits. We also have a forum so where, where people can come and, uh, and ask questions and we can answer them. Uh, and it's done uh, via discourse and also by Benoit. And basically for, uh, uh, for quizzes, um, we, have, we cannot put them on, on a public repo, obviously, uh, because otherwise uh, people will get the solution. Uh, so then we have a private GitLab repo for this. And also uh, part of the uh, Jupyter ecosystem that we use a lot is Binder, because like, when you give people instruction uh, for a live session where you want them to install something, like, there will always be some people where that have uh, issues, and you don't want to uh, troubleshoot these issues during the, the live training. So basically, having Binder is super useful to have a, a fallback for these people. OK, so the, the first part is the, the setup for developing the material. Uh, so basically, this part, as I said, we have uh, full freedom and we can do what we want, and this is great. 
Uh, so it's a public uh, GitHub repo. We use Jupyter Book for material uh, so that we can always have the rendering in a, in a website. It's, deplo it's deployed through GitHub pages. Uh, there you go. Uh, the way we uh, converge on is like to actually work on, uh, on Python file, uh, which is easier to version control, but then to use Visual Studio Code to be able to execute the Python file say, cell by, say by cell by cell. Uh, we found it was the most convenient thing to do for us. Uh, and basically, collaboration happened through a GitHub pull request. Um, we, have a, we have a CI setup to deploy on GitHub pages on each push, but we also have a CI setup inside PR to actually uh, uh, do the uh, run the run the notebooks uh, via Jupyter book and and to uh, to have the preview inside the PR to be able to look at the the random content. So not only do you see the diff on the Python file, which is readable, and then you can do comment online and this kind of stuff, the thing we're used to when you work on open source, but also you have the the rendering of the notebook so that you can see the actual uh, output of the cells. Okay. And, and the thing is, okay, it's great to work on Python file, but we also need notebooks, basically, because for uh, live training, then you will give this notebook to, uh, to students that will run them while you're, you're talking and running them on your computer, or for the MOOC, we actually need them in the Jupyter Hub environment as well, so, so we use JupyTeX to, to generate the uh, i, pi, y, and b from the .py file. And those are empty notebooks, basically. This is, uh, there's no output in them. Okay, and now come the, the Aki port where we had to, uh, you know, deliver this MOOC and uh, sometime uh, uh, there wasn't the functionality we needed or we didn't find it. I don't know if you know how to uh, handle this kind of stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, please let me know, but uh, uh, for f we use like a mist, so, uh, so a special markdown uh, uh, supported by Jupyter book. That, and for example, you can do admonition, like notes, and this kind of stuff. But when you generate the notebooks, then inside the notebook interface, MIST is not supported. So there is a, uh, some extension that I'm going to talk about in the future work stuff. But uh, at the time, there was no good way to uh, support it. And so basically, you get uh, you get the, the top at the, at the you get the top part in the notebook where you wanted the bottom part. So we had the Aki script to actually turn the turn the mist only for admonition to, to generate HTML and then uh, put it in the markdown cell in the notebook. We also have like uh, uh, some uh, quirks that we need to remove. So for example, one of them is uh, that you will get random cell IDs in the generated notebooks and uh, we just remove it because uh, we don't want that in our repo. Uh, it will introduce like uh, unuseful uh, diffs. Um, and also, like you, you realize weird stuff like dollars are not treated the same inside Jupyter Book and inside uh, inside uh, the Jupyter Notebook interface. So we do weird stuff to actually uh, make it work. And the reason we use dollars is because uh, uh, we had um, we had a data set with like uh, houses prices. Uh, okay, so that's for the custom acts we do to convert into notebooks. Uh, another thing that, that is super useful for live training is basically at the beginning we had these, all this file in the notebook interface and you would say, okay, now we're going to do the 0 to numerical pipeline x 0 0 thing and then people would be lost and they wouldn't find the, the file. And we actually, uh, from the Jupyter book underscore talk dot yaml, dot, so that list all the notebooks and the, the structure of your book, basically we, we created um, a script to generate a, a full index dot uh, i pi one and b, uh, so that then you can highlight, you know, okay, now we're going to do the working with numerical data thing, and then people have this uh, full index and they can just follow you. And additional uh, custom stuff we do is uh, is that uh, basically you have the um, on the Jupyter book you have the exercise without solution, and then afterward the solution. And then they tended to diverge when we, we were uh, handling them separately, and, and we have like uh, custom scripts to generate the, the exercise instruction from the exercise plus solution on the GitHub repo, and also we have a script to um, to sync basically um, our private repo quizzes with the solution uh, uh, to the GitHub repo where you don't have the solution. 
OK, so that was our, our uh, custom setup. So we are quite happy to, uh, to work like this, even if you know, some parts are a little bit uh, hacky, but it's, it's, uh, it works well enough. And, and we have this Jupyter book that looks like this. Uh, uh, and now what we want to do is to actually uh, get it to the FunMOOC uh, platform. So something that looks quite similar, you know, you have uh, like uh, parts on the left part, and then on the, on the top, if you're used to MOOC, then basically you have these, uh, some, of, uh, or some kind of horizontal tabs. Um, uh, so there you go. Uh, and how do you do that? So I would love to have a good story uh, how we automate this and, uh, and we're super happy, but actually uh, it's uh, done manually. So basically it's done manually and it's done manually thanks to the Inri Academy people, so in this case Laurence and Marie. Uh, so it's done manually, but basically what's done manually is mo mostly the mapping from the MOOC to our GitHub repo notebooks or, uh, or GitHub... Um, or get uh, or Jupyter book HTML. So it's also super useful to have this Jupyter book random HTML because that's the source of truth, right? Uh, Marie and, and Laurence don't need to ask us, okay, have you done something? Have you done an update? Can I use it now? It's always up to date and they can go there and they know that is the latest version. So that's super useful to have the Jupyter book at the source of truth. And basically, as I say, like what Laurence and Marie do is mostly uh, do some mapping between like MOOC uh, URL and say, okay, for this, for this MOOC page, um, go and fetch the HTML from this Jupyter book page or um, uh, create an iframe uh, with Jup the Jupyter hub on this notebook. Okay. And for the, so that's for the, uh, the, the notebook content, the, the HTML, like uh, end of uh, lesson or, or beginning of lesson content. And for the quiz, basically, we have some kind of markdown inside the private get, GitLab. And there it's, uh, it's fully manual. Basically, they have to uh, retype everything inside the, MOOC in, uh, the, the fun MOOC interface. And uh, unfortunately, there is no way, uh, no better way to do it. Or, the, or we didn't investigate enough time to find uh, a better way to do it, or it wasn't worth it. Um, okay, so that's for the fun MOOC. Um, and now we have this discourse forum, and the discourse forum is, uh, is really great. It's a great piece of software, and uh, it's super important to have a good forum, because you know, people are more likely to uh, ask questions if the forum uh, software is good. And also, you're going to spend a significant time trying to uh, understand and trying to answer a question there. So it's really great to, uh, to have a good piece of software for the, for the forum. And again, uh, it's, uh, uh, some, uh, it's not part of FunMOOC. It's actually done by the Inria, uh, Inria Learning Lab people. And one tweak we actually found super useful, and sometimes it's like this. A small tweak makes a huge impact. Uh, is actually to have, as I showed at the bottom, basically you have the, the FunMOOC page, and at the bottom you have a, a, a forum section that is only about this page. So people will see uh, only the question about this page, and also uh, when they click on new topics, they will ask in the right, uh, what is called discourse topic, basically. So then when you read the question, you have, uh, you have uh, exactly on which page uh, the question is about, which is super useful because the first session what we did is like having a forum tab every like, let's say five or six notebooks, and the question lacks context and it's super hard to understand what the question is about in some cases. So like the most impactful tweak was this uh, little thing, and I think uh, it was someone who followed the MOOC in the team and actually, uh, told us that in the last version of OpenEDX, they do this kind of thing, and that was definitely a great change. Okay. Um, and now the lesson, some lesson learned from running the MOOC. Uh, so like the success story is that sometimes we realize that people keep, kept making the same mistake. So one of these cases is uh, actually that when you do cross-validation and uh, that your model f f uh, fails on all uh, splits in scikit-learn, you get nans for everything, and people will get nan uh, score when they do the mean, and they wouldn't understand what it means, and you don't have any error, you just get, get nan. And now we change this to actually when you get only nan, so your, your fit fail on all the splits, then you will get an error in scikit-learn. So that, that's one of the best uh, success story. Um, 
rate increases is super hard. I mean, I think people that teach don't know that. Uh, as a software developer, I, I, I didn't know it would be that hard. And people will complain about quizzes because they, f they, they, they lose points. So losing points is a strong motivator. So, so you get more feedback about uh, quizzes that are not super clear or that are uh, not fair or whatever uh, they say. Uh, then actually, okay, this part is confusing in the notebooks because you don't get points for, for telling that. And especially on wrap-up quizzes, um, where you need to write code, then people would need code like slightly differently to the one we were expecting, and so they would get a different answer, as a, and they, um, they would uh, say, okay, but my code is correct, uh, I don't get the points, and uh, like, uh, adding like super explicit guidance to tell people what they're supposed to do and and expecting that you know sometime with random seed or this kind of stuff the, the result might be different is a lot of work to actually make uh, these wrap up quizzes uh, more robust and of course um, and again people who teach uh, know that uh, probably is that actually when you try to use the material for live teaching, that's where you realize that things are slightly off, that the flow is not correct, that you talk about something that you shouldn't mention at this point because it's not going to be clear. Okay, and um, again, like this uh, slide in particular is about like a software developer discovering things that teacher probably already know, but collaborating on pedagogical material is super hard compared to code, like the consensus is a lot harder to find. Uh, if you change something, it's going to have long distance impact on other parts of the course compared to code where you can, you know, have a little function that has all the logic and then the outside world only know to call the function. Uh, plenty of uh, consensus is harder, tension between uh, keeping things simple and not having them too simple. And also as a software developer, sometimes you want to, to solve code. Um, you want to solve problem by writing code and sometimes it's not worth it and you have to learn uh, uh, when to give up on this. So I have, I have two examples. One of them is like having links that work at, at the same time in Jupyter Book, in notebook interfaces, inside Fun MOOC. It was just way too hard, and we just gave up on this. So we just say, okay, in a future notebook, we will see in more details. In a previous notebook, we mentioned this in the notebook called blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's a bit frustrating, but it's the best we could do. Okay, some idea for the future. So one idea I had it was to um, maybe use Pyoda and Jupyter Lite instead of to replace Jupyter Hub. So I did some investigation to see the, the state of like uh, scikit-learn inside um, uh, Pyodide. And I did some work on Pyodide to improve it. So there are still some issues with SciPy. Uh, the scikit-learn uh, test suite passes on uh, the Pyodide dev version. Uh, uh, except a few XVAL tests due to Pyodal limitation and, and also some uh, uh, development like uh, a few uh, weeks ago. Then now you have a Jupyter Lite button in, a, uh, in the scikit-learn examples where you can click and run the, the example in, uh, in, uh, in Jupyter Lite. And there are other things like, uh, as I said, like we have got some crit for missed admonition, uh, but in principle you have this uh, extension that supports it and uh, and also, to, to use it, to use this Jupyter Lab Mist, we should move away from classical notebook to retro lab, so that's another thing to do. And I'll leave you, uh, that's the end of my talk, thanks for your attention, and I'll leave you with a few links for the repo on the website and the MOOC. Thank you, Luke. Uh, we have time for questions. Anyone? Anyone? Um, maybe not directly a question, but uh, I'm among the 93% of people that started the, the MOOC and okay. ended up with it. <laughs> but uh, um, basically, the, the MOOC is, is excellent. I mean, uh, all the points you've been uh, talking about, for example, e even shortly, for example, the fact that you uh, start, um, you don't want to put people in uh, deep mathematics to start with, so you end up with the pipeline and the process instead mm -hmm. of a very high focus on the model. It, it's, it's really smart. The way you've done quizzes, uh, I think uh, first uh, small quizzes to test memorization and basic comprehension, then uh, a way to have quizzes, but you need to make some code in the notebook to be able to answer the questions. And also what you've been talking about, robustification of the questions. Mm -hmm. For uh, for example, you, you end up with um, um, asking about a range of solutions. Is a solution, for example, do you have underfitting or overfitting? When you ask things like that, like that, you can have some different codes, but you end up with normally the, the same answer. So 
everything works, works really well. Actually, the only points of frustration I had were with the integration of the, the tooling. Because uh, uh, and it's it's not uh, your, your your fault. I mean, uh, this course I think is, is really good. Jupyter is really good. Uh, I personally don't like edX and uh, the user experience, but you end up with uh, a feeling that uh, the thing is um, is not a wall. I mean, there there are, there are several things that you you try to integrate, and you, you obviously do the best, and it works. But you, you just feel that you don't have an integrated learning um, uh, product. So. That's the only thing. But, but overall, I, 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 uh, everything, everyone here can can try the MOOC. It's it's really uh, extremely good. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, thanks for your comments. I, I agree with you about the fun MOOC experience. It's a bit clunky, but it's the best we could do with like the time we had. And uh, but there are plenty of uh, ideas for improvement. It's just that sometimes it's uh, not clear whether you're going to spend like two months convincing some fun MOOC people to change some stuff or. Uh, so yeah, and, and if you haven't had time to finish the course, so you can always use the Jupyter uh, uh, book, but if you want the certificate or you want the full uh, MOOC experience, in principle, they so we're supposed to talk about that like uh, Monday, so uh, soon, like, but in principle, there should be another session uh, coming up. Uh, it's not clear, but before the end of 2023. And uh, also, we might also leave it open like uh, always. Instead of having like a um, focus session, we, we're going to discuss about that. Um, yeah. We have time for another question. So thank you for your very inspiring and interesting talk. So we are working on auto grading, which is difficult, I know, but I would like to uh, know your experience or your hopes about this. So, so personally, some of the best MOOC I've done, like so, eight years ago now, uh, ten years ago, maybe, uh, uh, they were like some nice things where you could submit your solution, it would run, and then you get some che uh, green check mark, and you were best, super happy about that. Uh, so I agree, it's super important. Uh, inside a fun MOOC, like uh, so, we ask a little bit about you know using NB Grader or this kind of stuff. There might be other technology around that I don't know. Uh, and their answer was like, okay, it's going to be complicated, so we gave up. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Luke, for this great presentation and a very successful MOOC. Uh, can we have the next speaker change their computer? Yeah. But then, we, if there's any one last question, we can answer. Thank you, Luke. Again, a round of applause. Thank you.